morning, everybody. Welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. Now, what's with just having two people in the middle row? Row, and you lot all on the sides here. That looks a bit funny from here. I don't know, how about we come up a little bit closer and some other people come right into the middle? There's nothing wrong with that. There is the Muriel. Come on. Yeah, come on, join on in. You see? You sing a bit better when we're a bit closer together too. And it's a lovely holiday weekend, but welcome everybody. Welcome. Welcome. Great to see you here today. It's, um, <laughs> um, I've, um, I'm sorry to say poor little sum of his end hasn't been very well this week. And um, so Jess and her... Well, actually, the whole Bazan family, they've had a bit of a tough week, I think. Um, Nathan with some, he's not, uh, the wisdom teeth, he's having trouble with that. For those, pe- those people who've had wisdom teeth trouble before, you'll be, your hearts will be going out to him. But um, little Summer hasn't been too well either. So they, um, they, uh, um, they are not on deck this morning and they asked whether we would um, do it. And we said, sure thing, we'd love to. And so Glennis will be preaching a little later on and I'll be leading in our wish, um, leading you guys if I'd love to, in worship. Now, um, I don't know about you, but this has been a bit of a tough week, and it's actually been a tough time. This has been an unprecedented year, really, hasn't it? Well, of course, no, that's an understatement. And we've had a whole pile of different things thrown at us, and um, things that, you know, this time last year we would have thought we wouldn't have dreamed of some of the things that have gone down in this last year, um, you know, in the last... Even since lockdown, we wouldn't have dreamed of some of the things that have been going down. And we think, what on earth is going on here? You know, but um, with all that, it's scripture that reminds us how great God is and how he is worthy of our praise. And today I'm going to read just some um, favorite verses from First Chronicles. And I want you to focus your mind and your heart on God and let your praise go up regardless of what has been coming at us and at our friends and found our family. Um, Jesus said, we are to worship in spirit and in truth. You hear that? Spirit and in truth. And these verses, they're going to help you access the power of the Holy Spirit. Guarantee it. Okay? And the truth of the scripture in order to experience true worship this morning. So, as I share these ones now, I want you to sort of open up and see and think in for yourself, where is the truth in my worship today? Where is God in this? You know, it doesn't matter what's going on, God is still on the throne. He is the King of Kings and he's got this. He's got you in his grip. Here are the words from First Chronicles chapter 16, verses 21 Sorry, 23, 23 to 31. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among the people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord, he is the one who made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and joy in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Not what's going on ourselves, his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established and it cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. And I know we can say amen to that this morning. It doesn't matter what's going on ourselves. God is the center and he is in control and he is the one where we've got our foundation. Amen to that? Yeah. 
blessing and honour to the Ancient of Days. Let's stand and in heart with true worship, let's worship him this morning. Thanks, everybody. And have some fun. we welcome you here today and Lord we pray and we worship and glorify you in spirit and in truth this morning not because of what we are but because of what you've done and not because of who we are but who you are in us thank you Lord thank you we continue and we're going to praise the Father praise the Son praise the Spirit three in one that ancient of days God was here before the beginning of time and we have got the privilege of worshipping him this morning, King of Kings. In the darkness you were waiting, without hope, without light. From the heaven you came running, there was mercy.
Jesus, that's what we mean this morning. And as we continue right now, take that not just from our lips, but from our hearts, Father. We want your strength this morning. We need your love, that unconditional love. Pour yourself out afresh. Great are your mercies every day. We thank you, Father, for who you are. And we all say, Amen. Have a seat, everybody. Sorry, it's taking us a bit of a while to get organised. Um, nice to see you all. Uh, music team, you were great this morning. I love that. It's quite nice. You know, I'm often at the piano, and I really enjoy just being there in the row, able to appreciate how good they are. Um, that, was, that was just great, all of you that were playing and singing. Um, now, this song, it's some of you that have been around the Salvation Army for a while um, will know the names Gwyneth, Gwyneth sorry, and Robert Redhead. And um, in the 70s... Um, the, the, the Salvation Army actually, composers in the Salvation Army wrote a number of musicals uh, in earlier days. Some of you may have been involved with those, but this was from a, a musical called Ruth, and um, these are words that Ruth spoke um, in the musical. And they're written in the third person, as you can see behind us. If you just pop them up there, Paul, that'd be cool. And um, we, we kind of, sometimes at Soul Praise, we have a, a chat about the words of our songs to say, what do these mean to us? And... Um, this song, you'll, you'll see we sing about, Lord, give them strength and give them wisdom and things like that. And we were sort of thinking, this is a bit weird, because normally if we sing a song like that, we'd be praying to God to give that to us. So we, we sort of thought about, what, is this word, what do these words mean to us? And they'll mean whatever they mean to you. But one way to think about them is as a prayer that we might utter for our children or for those that are dear to us that are you know, struggling or following um, God's path for them. So, um, and it felt quite apt in this morning. Catherine's going to sing a bit of a solo towards the end of it. And for you, Catherine, thinking about your role looking after children's ministries, um, I think it's it's really apt that you do that this morning as well. So.
hope these words are meaningful to you, but that's, that's a way you could think about interpreting them, maybe, if you want to. We sponsor 25 kids in Tonga um, 
and Fiji. And if you have any spare change, can you please hold it up in the air and the kids will come around and collect it. God, thank you for this opportunity to support um, our mission field. Father, we pray you'll take this money, that it will multiply, that you'll use it in your kingdom. Father, for the families connected to the kindergarten and the, um, and the children we sponsor, Lord, that there would be a shift in what's happening in these situations, Lord, that your presence would be there, um, that there'd be a hunger more, for more of you, in your name. Amen. Catherine. Awesome. So somewhere that there's hidden is a treasure chest. I don't know where it is because Mr. Mark hid it this morning. inside today? Chocolate? <laughs> What's have you got, Izzy? Traffic cone. What have you got, James? Towel. Towel? What have you got? You can add a sponge. I got a sponge. You got a sponge? A tea towel. towel. I don't think that's a tea towel. Maybe try to open it up and see what it is. <laughs> Oh, apron. Hey, what did you say? Apron. An apron. All right, so we're talking today about Jesus washing his disciples' feet. So we're going to have lots of fun, and we're going to have shoes off today in kids' church. So we'll be good. All right, let's go, kids. Can you bring the treasure chest with you? You guys have loads of fun. Don't get Catherine wet, okay? <laughs> oh, super done. Super fun. <clears throat> We're going to continue worshipping the Lord um, and with the giving of your own offerings at the same time as we sing a new version, you would not have heard this version before, of Would You Be Free of Your Burden of Sin. Hey, this song here, by the way, though, has got wonderful words in it. We can sort of just do a little bit of a, a check for yourself as you're going with this and remember how and just... Um, how powerful the blood of the Lamb is to us. Let's stand and have fun as we have a go with the notions of the and warning. Now, it's going to be great. And if you want to start dancing, go for it too. Here you go. Here you go. Here we go.
indeed. Thank you, Lord, for the precious power and the blood. The precious blood flowed for each one of us. Thank you, Jesus, that we can give freely our offerings back to you to build your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you, beautiful Is assistant. Me? Yes, thank you. Come. <laughs> Let's get out a few things. There we go. Right, we're going to have some PowerPoint pictures hopefully up on the screen. Would you walk down that corridor? First look, it doesn't look safe, but it is an optical illusion. It is very safe to walk down there. So many people go through life, first impressions, they get frightened off by things. But checking the reality of something can make a whole different perspective and see that it is safe to progress and to keep journeying. So first impression of that would be, <gasps> no way. It takes us about 30 seconds, I'm told, the researchers say, to make an impression about something. We observe what's going on, we notice things, then we compare with what we already know. So we already know that a corridor is supposed to be straight, but we know that when there's a, a dip in it, it might not be safe. But that is an optical illusion, the way it's been painted. And we've made a judgment about, would I risk it? There is wisdom always in checking whether our judgments or our first impressions are actually true. Have a look at this elephant. At first glance, it looks like the old elephants that we know how an elephant's supposed to look. Would it be able to walk? How many legs has it got? Four. You sure? Oh, sorry, five. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's again another artistic optical illusion. The next one, compare the two orange circles. Uh, what's different in their sizes. They are exactly the same. And in that one, it's the setting, the circumstances, the surroundings that makes a difference. Have you ever been judged by the people that you spend time with? Have you ever had people make an assessment of you because of who your friends are or what your family name is? And sometimes there's people around us who just make us look small. But the reality is it hasn't actually changed who we are. Have a look at the next optical illusion. What would you say is different about those tables? Actually, the dimensions of both those tabletops is exactly the same. Now that's hard to believe just visually, but I'm going to pass out if somebody would pass around to everybody um, some pages of those optical illusions and some others so that you can check it out later. Because it is always good to check out what a preacher is telling you. Not just believe it at, at first impression. To check out what other people are telling you. To check out what the setting is, what the context is, what the circumstances are around something. To believe whether what you are seeing can actually be held as truth. Those two tabletops are exactly the same size, even though it doesn't appear that way. Because when things are put into a different context, they're viewed from a different perspective. Each of those optical illusions prompts us to check out our assumptions and relook at the settings. The same item in different circumstances the same person in different circumstances can appear differently. So there is caution for us to be aware of the circumstances around us and to choose wisely. Many people go through life comparing themselves to others. They spot the difference between themselves and someone else. And that leads either to an overinflated opinion of themselves saying, <laughs> I'm not like them. 
and, a, and an ego of superiority or, oh, no, I'm not like them, and a low self-esteem. Because opinions that are based on noticing what is different in something, they tend to separate and keep people apart and to isolate. But opinions that are based on what is similar help to relate and connect. There's so many picture puzzles and children's activity pages that ask us to spot the difference in puzzles. So there's 10 differences in that picture. But how many things in those pictures would actually be the same? Far outweigh the 10 things that are different. Lots of people focus us on the differences between people and get critical and overlook the things that they have in common. What's the difference between a small candle light and the light from a lighthouse? What's the differences? Strength, yes. The lens is bigger, yes. So what are the strengths of the beam from a lighthouse? What is it What's its purpose? What's it there for? What does it achieve? It's a beacon? See from far away? Safety? It's obvious. It's immovable. It's a rescue in a dark situation, in a storm. So even though one small candle may not have the same power or strength as the, as the beam from a lighthouse. What is similar about the light from one candle? It's, it pushes back darkness. It still has the same ability as the brightest light that ever could be. It pushes back the darkness. The intensity and the strength varies, but they both push back the darkness. On Thursday night this week, I spoke at Recovery Church at the Newtown Centre, and I used this comparison there, asking you, what is the difference between someone who's been sober for one day and someone who has been sober for many years? One might just manage to be a small glimmer, and the other one might be a shining, strong light. Someone might just feel as though they're flickering and changing and, and things are not um, steady. But that one small light has the same ability to push back darkness as does someone who's been on that journey for a long time. What's the difference, the similarity between a one-month sober person and a person who's been in recovery for a long time? Every decision needs to be one that is either good or bad. That's the same for all of us. Do you remember the chorus? See this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I learned in Sunday school a long time ago, small things can make a big difference in someone else's life. Like with those pictures I started with, my perception of something may not be how someone else sees it. These are classic um, optical illusions. Do you see the vase or the two men's faces? Do you see the young woman facing away or the older woman with a relatively good-sized nose? <laughs> we have a view from a different perspective in many situations. I might think saying one kind word of encouragement to someone was just a small impact, but for that person might have been the only one who said something, praised them for that week. One small thing can make a big difference. Every decision you or I have to make, we could see from one perspective or the other. We have the opportunity to make a good decision or the opportunity to make an unwise choice. So what is the difference between someone who has been a Christian for years and someone who has recently been given new life? Maybe one seems as though they might be just a small flickering candle compared to someone who seems to glow and really, really brightly shine for the Lord. What's the similarity between a long-time believer and a new follower? Both have been cleansed of the darkness of the past. Both have had their sins forgiven. Both have a relationship with Jesus as Lord and Saviour, and both have to keep on learning how to honour God and make wise choices on the way. 
I was born into a family of people who loved God, who prayed for me, who taught me how to love Jesus and to love others, who provided an atmosphere to help me learn about being loved and how to express love healthily. But no matter how supposedly great anybody's upbringing is, every individual has their own free will. No one person's story has everything in common with others, yet there are similarities. Some are gifted with the opportunity to be informed to make healthy choices, yet every person has the opportunity to rebel, to be defiant, to um, be angry. We are all people who Jesus died to forgive. My sins, my anger, my unforgiveness, he has offered to cleanse me from, to deal with whatever I'm prepared to allow him to deal with. So what is the difference between Jesus and you or me? He lived a life that continually pleased God. I know I haven't, and I guess you may have had some moments too, so we've got that in common. And we might feel like just a small flickering candle compared to Jesus, who is known as the light of the world, brighter than the star or the morning sun. There are church songs and choruses that encourage us to be like Jesus, to look. So what is the similarity between Jesus and you and me? We are all loved by God. When God looks at someone who has accepted Jesus as Christ and Lord and had our sins forgiven, God sees us as right, as righteous through Jesus, because of Jesus. When we choose to give our life over and accept Jesus as Lord, that makes us family. It, we have something in common. We are known as the family of God. Jesus is our eternal brother, in a sense. And God is our father. We have that family connection, that familiarity. And if you haven't ever yet come to that decision of, of considering Jesus as Lord and Saviour, perhaps just light a possibility of thought today as a beginning and start to look for what you have in common with God. God who is loving, God who is forgiving, God who is patient, God who is loves me even though he knows me so well. On the other side of the page of illusions that's been handed out are some scriptural truths. Back in the very book, beginning of the Bible, in Genesis, it, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that it was good and he separated the light from the darkness. Light has the power to push back darkness. It is separated because God wants it to be different. You know, if you were standing immediately under a light beam, there would be no shadows. The further you get away from a center of a light beam, then the more shadow and darkness that there is. So the closer we stay to the light of God, the what he illumines on our pathway and what he shines into our life experiences, the less darkness, the less shadow there is able to be. In the New Testament, in the, in the prologue of the Gospel of John, light is defined as life. For in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and he was with God in the beginning, speaking about Jesus. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light for all humankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, says John's prologue. So what is our similarity to that life, that light, to Jesus, to God? In Genesis 1.26, it said, God made us like him, in his image. We have a lot in common with God. We have the ability to forgive. We have the ability to show compassion. We have the ability to be loving. Because God created us in his image. And what God saw that he had made was good. There was a rich young ruler in the New Testament who came and addressed Jesus as good. And he said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. But if we go back to the beginnings of God's design and creation, he saw us as like him. 
good, of value. And in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is that beautiful story of the creation, the reality of God's goodness, God's creativity. Any person who has ever been an inventor or a designer is like God because they have creativity. Anyone who's been a thinker and a planner is like God because he is the great designer. So that was chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Genesis. Beautiful, good. And at the end of chapter 2, it finishes by saying, Adam and Eve felt no shame. They were like God. They felt no shame. It says they were naked, but they felt no shame. But the very next verse in chapter 3 begins their downfall with the crafty serpent who points out how unlike God they are. In Eden, Satan got Adam and Eve to compare themselves unfavorably with God. Their knowledge was limited. They had a difference. They saw themselves as inferior. God had made them in his own image to be like him and focused on that similarity. Satan pointed out their differences and manipulated them. And the consequence was they lied to God, they hid from God, they felt ashamed. When we look at the differences and exaggerating them, using them to put ourselves down in our own thinking, we have a critical judge who says, you're no good, you can't do that. Or we may have had words spoken into us by other people's opinions throughout the years who said, why bother? And yet if we look at things from a different perspective, we can put out and say, that is not who I am. Regardless, it may look that way to somebody else. I am not going to be made small by somebody else's surroundings, someone else's opinion of me. If we listen to this a neutral observer and hear a different perspective and see a new view, we compare and can look for healthier observations and not listen to the judge so harshly within our heads. If I dwell in shame like Adam and Eve did, I look for the differences and think how inferior I might be and be condemned and see that I can't measure up to God's holiness. But God says, I am holy. You can be holy too because I made you that way. I want you that way. That's God's will for us to live lives that honor him, that are holy, that are righteous. And we can do it because Jesus said we can. And he showed us the perfect example. And we are like him. We sing to be like Jesus. It's not to be, we have to be aware of there are some differences. And we have to keep them in balance and a bit of a healthy perspective. If we're looking from a wounded, shame-based place, then they're going to get out of proportion. But if we look for what is similar, what we have in common with God who is here with us, who says, I will never leave you, that gives us the companionship of his spirit to empower us, to help us to shine in a dark world, we can check out with a healthy guilt and say, oh, my behaviour, my words, my actions didn't quite measure up to my values, my standards or God's standards and then ask for forgiveness. Notice those kind of differences. So if we are aiming to be like Jesus, what are our similarities? What do we have in common with Jesus? Jesus spoke in John chapter 8 verse 12 saying that he was the light of the world, and that whoever follows him won't have to walk in darkness, but will be, have the light of life. Jesus, the light of the world. I haven't got a, haven't got a spotlight or a um, lighthouse, but I've just got a single candle. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever walks with me 
We'll never walk in darkness, but we'll have the light of life. In comparison, we might just feel like a little candle. Because we, what we have in common with Jesus, he says, I am the light of the world. And then a few verses later in another of the Gospels, he says, you are the light of the world. You've got that light. Now shine. Let your light shine so that others may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Don't hide your light. Let it shine. So what are your good deeds? What was... What was Jesus' job, his mission, his call, his time? And he said, we're going to go and do even greater things than he did. He said, we've got that in common. We've got the same mission statement as, as Jesus, to go and make disciples. What are our similarities to what Jesus does? What's our job? What's our mission, our calling? As I said, I spoke at Recovery Church and I, four times a year, teach the 12 Steps course at the training college and, and at the Centre for Leadership Development. And step 12 of the AA statement says that having had a spiritual experience as a result of working through the steps, we tried to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. That's what Jesus asked every believer to do having had an awareness that Jesus is the one who lightens up our life, who takes away burdens, who forgives sins, who, who lives within us, our message is to go and share that, to spread the light. Christians have had a spiritual awakening. We've heard the good news. We've, we're walking on a new pathway. We are instructed by Jesus to go and make disciples, to do what Jesus would do. Does that sound like too big a job? But look at it from a reality perspective and don't be frightened by the fake corridor or the big mission task. Just make it a walkable pathway. Break it down into doable steps. Many years ago, I learned a song, Grandma's songs from many years ago, and I used the words of this song as my life's testimony in a sense. To love someone more dearly every day. I can make contact with my family. I can say an encouraging word to someone. I can send an email. How is it to love someone? To pray for them is to love for them. We can love because God first loved us. So we can do that. To help a wandering child to find their way. If we know the pathway, we can give advice. We can give interest. We can show direction. Um, and correction as if we're asked for it. We can share the light. We can think about good things. There's a scripture verse that says, whatsoever things are just and honest and noble and lovely and true, think about those things. And to pray. Jesus spent time praying and focusing on scripture. That's our job too. And to smile when evening falls. Just one day at a time, find something to be grateful for. That's our task. Can we do that? Yes. Break it down piece by piece to be like Jesus. These tasks are not overly complicated. To remind you to be the light, to do your best, to learn to obey God when he speaks to you through his Holy Spirit and asks you to do something. The next verse says, to follow truth as blind men long for light, to do my best from dawn of day till night, to keep my heart fit for his holy sight, and answer when God calls, and answer when he calls. That's my job. That's my task, and that's yours too. Can we do it? Yeah.
Yes. So one candle by itself might not glow overly brightly, but it does destroy the immediate darkness around it. And the more connection you have with others who are glowing and sharing the light of Jesus, the brighter the impact. So we are to keep on glowing, to keep on growing and stayed in connection with others who shine for Jesus and to help the glow get brighter. I brought a CD with me to play of an old a songster piece, a hymn from a long time ago, but we don't have the technology to play a CD here anymore. I'm ancient. <laughs> and it was one that said, Lord, let your light shine on us. Lord, let your light of your face shine on us. Why? So that we may be saved. So that we may have life to find our way in the darkest night. Lord, let your light shine on us. But not being able to play that songs to peace, I found a, a YouTube clip by Bethel Music entitled the same title, Shine On Us. So while this song plays, I'm going to invite you to come and light a small candle from that one candle, just as a symbol that I'm in this with Jesus. I can do my bit. I can do my task day by day by day. And if it's the first time you've even considered that glimmer of thought, just light a spark of hope. Ask someone to pray with you, to get glow together, to shine together. If you've previously accepted Christ as your Lord, then you're invited to come and light a candle too and say, yes, Lord, I'm going to continue to shine for you in my daily life. Just where I am. Because Jesus, you are the light of the world. You've said I am, to, am the light of the world. So I'm going to do it with your strength, Lighthouse, and I'll just keep on glowing where I can, day by day. So come as the music plays and light a candle, if you would, as this song plays.
Today, Lord, we have asked you to relight us. Give us the flame of your love. Give us a flame of forgiveness. Give us a glimmer of hope. Give us the glow of your truth in our lives. Show us your love to flow over us and through us that we may let our light shine in this world and not be hidden. That we would shine for you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we, as a people before you, say, shine light on our path. By your spirit, give us direction that we may shine for you in a world that is looking for light, for hope, for truth. Lord, thank you that your light pushes back our personal darkness. So as we go from this place, help us to shine for our good deeds, our kindness to others, our helpfulness to someone. Shine truth and love into their life as we go obeying your task for us to make disciples and be your disciples that shine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Powerful. Powerful imagery, isn't it? The light. Do you know how easy it was to just take your candle and put it with the Christ light? That's how easy it is, isn't it? Just to to not recognise God's light there, Jesus' light, and to, we don't have to do anything. And his light, does that make sense on that one? It's an easy step. We don't, there's not much we need to do to let God's light shine through us. With that, yeah, thank you. You give light, you are light. You give life, you are love. And you bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Let's sing this. I'll invite you to stand now or a little bit later on. I will have everybody stand by the end. If you would like to see how we go with it. But let's sing, Great are you, Lord. Thanks. You give life. 
falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory majesty power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages and forevermore amen amen thanks friends okay I'm on take note this morning um, before that though, I'd just like to share with you something my friend composes songs about sewing machines. He's a singer-songwriter, or so it seems. <laughs> that had you in stitches, eh? <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Righty, hey, just a few things. Um, and I had to go out during the service to get the copy of the newsletter because I'd forgotten to have a read beforehand. But I'll just highlight a few things. Um, first off, stuff the trailer. We no, we no longer do toot for tucker. We do stuff the trailer. Um, this is happening on the 28th of November, and in association with the Inner Wheel and Rotary, um, we're having a collection at both New World and Countdown. The uh, stuff the trail will occur from 8.30 to 4.30, and if you're available, it'll be great to have as many down there as possible over a couple of hour period during the day. There is also a bunch of sorting that occurs here at 4 o'clock, so stuff the trailer, 8 till 4.30, sorry, 8.30 to 4.30, Getting things sorted back here starting at four. But on the, um, on the table out the front, if you haven't already got a copy of this, you can fill your name in, uh, whether you want to be at Countdown or New World or both. Um, and if you want to help out with the sausage sizzle, um, I think Sarah was going to see if Soul Praise was available to sing over that period or some of it. Is that right, Sarah? You haven't asked anyone yet? Well, we'll talk about that on Wednesday probably. 28th of November, Saturday 28th of November. Um, so we'll give you some feedback on that later. So yeah, that's in the newsletter, so please have a look at that and um, prayerfully think about it and put some times down and hand it back in. Uh, the men's breakfast is coming up on Saturday, this, this coming Saturday, starting at 8 o'clock, going through till 10. Uh, and um, um, Don't know, last I know it's happening, but... Oh, okay. May not happen because Nathan is will be incapacitated. Um, yeah, so watch that space, Sarah. Okay, Sarah. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Good idea. So regardless of whether Nathan's there or not, just fill out the form or, or send an email back to the email address that's on there, and we'll see how things go later in the week. Um, all right, the next Awaken service is on Sunday the 8th of November, 5 o'clock, and it will be where? Here, at Tower. Um, and 2021 calendars are available. Talk to Sharon, core administrator, and they go for a price of $5, and the fund's going to... Sorry? Just going back into the cost of producing the calendars. Okay, all right. Um, there's a bunch of community ministries, things happening around Christmas hampers, um, and if you're able to help out with any of those, including stuff the trailer, the details are in the, um, in the newsletter. Uh, what else? I think that's about it that highlights the main things that are there. Um, has anyone else got anything they want to add? No one is rushing up to grab the microphone. So we'll call it quits there for the day. Lovely to have you all here today. Um, tea and coffee is up. Glennis is in the kitchen just getting the, the tea and the coffee ready. So please stay and have a tea and coffee, have a chat, um, and have a great week. Thank you. <laughs>